want to do that at the beginning or the end? Okay, it's your podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Bass Bros Podcast. Philip has two news topics he's bringing to the table today. He's very excited about and we have again my dad Philip Friedman and I say again because I didn't record the last episode I kind of I think I turned it off midway it was such a bad podcast <laughs> <laughs> makes sense but no it was actually a really good podcast I'm so bummed that we didn't get that recorded we're going to try to replicate it as best as we can um last podcast that didn't air we went through your kind of history with 976 tuna what you're doing now with Friedman Adventures kind of how you grew up and stuff like that um, I imagine we'll revisit maybe some other stories, different stories, but we'll we'll try to get through that history again. Philip, you, would you want to do the news first, or I don't know, what do you guys think? What do you they're, think? They're, they're, dumb, they're dumb news things. That's, uh, What's in the news? Um, Taylor Swift made her first <laughs> billion dollars. That's the big thing right now. The 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 headline was Who gives a crap about that. Well, the headline was. Hey, watch much, that microphone. I mean, oh, wait a second. Taylor, she made a billion. Wow. Yeah. Well, the headline was... Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Speaking of the microphone, yeah, boys. Yeah, so I'm sorry. The headline was how much further a NFL football player got her. Oh. Fine. That, that's what burst her through the threshold into the oh, billion dollars. She was already making tons of money, wasn't she? No, it? but that guy, that guy put her on the map. Oh, yeah? Yes. Travis Kelsey. Yeah. He's huge. He's got his own podcast, all that. Okay. So he put I her... I thought she was way bigger than him. Not at all. She, she, you sure about that? She busted into the spotlight from dating him. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> right, Patrick? Well, she's doing insane concerts every what, week. Before she started dating him, did she have a billion dollars? She's probably close. She <laughs> she's knocking on the door. Now that she's with him, she's got a billion. <laughs> I mean, they have the Swifties or whatever they call them, all her fans, the Swifties and... In fact, like the NFL looked at the demographics of a game. Uh oh, Dad's and, prepared, dude. And uh, <laughs> there were all of a sudden a whole bunch of women watching NFL football because of how good looking. Why Kelsey wouldn't they be watching is. that before she got? He's good looking before because she, she got came onto out. the news. You're, you're biting this hook, line, and sinker. And the whole oh, point of this is was the best with the audience. Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was going like, what the I'm hell, too? I'm, I'm arguing with you. What the hell? Yeah, no shit, she was big. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the other news What else article, is in the news? You <laughs> fell for it, actually. Oh, I was like, I don't know. There's no way. <laughs> the other news thing is, uh, did you ever hear the story of the walleye guys that got caught yeah. stuffing lead in the fish? Yes. Well, one of the guys just got arrested for poaching deer. Really? Yes. Yeah, so he oh, had well. three dead deer. On his prop, three deer heads in his living room that were fresh. And guy's he- consistent, man. Yeah. You gotta give it to him. He's a crook <laughs> in everything he does, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what's weird to me about those things, right? Because there's always gonna be cheaters in big money tournaments, right? There's always gonna be cheaters. So, and those guys are winning a lot of the money. So it's weird when well, it's, it's people whenever- you look up to are yeah. Like well, it could be anybody. Yeah. Wait, what's... Boys, let the truth be known. Yeah. When I was growing up, I was 12 years old on the Redondo Special. There was more times than one or two times when somebody slid a torpedo sinker down. A oh, for the jackpot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Without waiting the, the deck tail. can because you wanted your deadhead to win because you get the entire jackpot. And, you know, we're talking 60 bucks in those days, maybe. Yeah. And so, I mean, you guys have been doing that for a long, long time. The, the stupid thing is, and the thing that you didn't want to happen when you weighed the jackpot was, you have this big, giant calico bass here, and then one that's not that big, and it just goes... Yeah, it looks and insane. It's like, and it's like, wait a minute, how can that be? So, yeah, it... it uh, take those ones... On forever. It'd take those ones home whole, I'd imagine. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's also, whenever money's involved, like, I just read some article on someone who does the codes for the lottery. His family members were winning on the, like, 10th of October, the... 11th of February and they connected it and he was writing an algorithm and giving them numbers. Oh yeah, I saw that. That was pretty oh, cool. I didn't see that. This guy had like 20 people win the jackpot. For him. Really? Yeah. But like it would be like a friend's cousin. Did they bust him? Yeah. yeah. He got, he's yeah. in prison. Oh yeah. It would be, yeah. Because so he could write the code. Involved. Yeah. Some shady stuff's going to go on. Yeah. We just got to figure out how to do the shady stuff and not get caught. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> We did pretty well on the Redondo special. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, they were, they were. Dad was writing the codes. News items. The Swifty. What do you think about that, Dad? About what? We got a news briefing on the show now. I thought it was great, man. I love current events, and those are perhaps the most important things going on <laughs> in current events right now. Yeah. Not World War Three. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, but awesome. Trying to keep it light here, so I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Philip, for coming prepared with some news events. That's awesome. That was really I have exciting. nothing prepared, so that's yeah, awesome. That makes two of us. I saw two of those, and I thought they'd be kind of funny. Yeah, that's funny. I had uh, <laughs> I had a, a couple of things. Go- we have some couple of cool things going on at Canyon Lake. And I'm bummed to be moving out of here and going to Florida. But we figured out the crappie bite. And it is so much fun. Because figured out the bass too. But we would throw shallow all day and catch little bass. Little bass, little bass, little bass. So I was like, ah, I'm sick of this. Let's go try to catch these crappie. Figured out the crappie bite. Caught him all day. I got a burp coming. I'm so sorry. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) So we figured out the crappie bite in like 15 to 30 foot of water. And those bass are in there with them. So you're catching all these crappie. And all of a sudden, five pounder will eat your swim bait. The same thing that the crappie are eating. So it's kind of a really cool, fun deal out here because you're messing with these things all day and you never know. We caught catfish out of this, those schools and stuff. And Philip caught a trophy black crappie today. Philip, you want to talk about it? Oh, I was stoked. I, I thought it was a bass. I just immediately looked at Patrick and said, get the damn net. It's a, it's a big bass. It came up and it was a 15 and a quarter inch crappie, which I read online is a trophy, is worthy of taxidermy, but more importantly, bragging rights. Oh. So, Wow. So if there's any crappie fishermen out there, let us know if that's uh, anything. Or is the taxidermist trying yeah. to get you to... <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a big crappie or not? I read that... Who are the guys up north, Pat? The, two, the brothers up there that do uh, tackle... Oh, tackle yeah, yeah, yeah. Tackle bass. That, that's yeah. the article I read. Oh, they're pretty... Li- uh, oh, it wasn't legit. It taxidermy? No, no, no. It was oh. tactical. <laughs> I bass. honestly thought it was. No. <laughs> the taxidermy would have like a 10 inch. Yeah. Make sure you send your $500 <laughs> deposit in immediately. So I think we are going to get it taxidermy, not because I really care about that fish, but it'd be cool to put up on the wall and yeah, a memory Canadian. forever. Who knows? That might be one of the smaller ones by the time we get through with these things. Yeah. There's definitely, I definitely think there's a bigger crappie in that lake. The thing was awesome and huge. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have drank this fake beer. It's killing me. <laughs> Burping so much. I should have went with the coffee. So let's get into your history, Father. What? Where do you start? How did you Father get, Felipe. Yeah. yeah. How did you get into fishing? Yes. You, you asked this question to so many people, and I feel like you kind of don't get that question asked to you a lot. Right. Uh, probably my first memories. I have some early childhood memories, but... One was fishing on the old Mondstadt Pier down in Redondo, uh, that straight pier. You know, there used to be all these characters on there. Yeah. There was, I can't remember their names now, but there were guys that would make these long casts off the end of that pier. We'd watch them and catch these big bokasha because there's a Redondo Canyon that's really deep. Oh, yeah. I've these scooped guys could that access thing. that yeah. and catch those. There's also where you would cast a sinker out and then take a clip-on swivel and... You would slide a bait down. We call that a slider. You'd mm. slide your anchovy down. Big Bonita would bite that. But before that, uh, I was three years old. My dad got my brother Paul and I some drop lines, those yellow-looking uh, plastic, kind of a spool with a green Dacron line. Yeah. And, man, we caught these big piling perch, and we were just hooked after that. Was Grandpa Albert into fishing a lot? Or not, not really? really. Yeah. I mean, when he was in his youth, um, he talked about fishing on Point Magoo. He had a day where he had 22 halibut on the pier. Uh, he talked about black sea bass swimming in, and the uh, guys that ran the concession there with some Japanese guys, and they'd come out and actually catch two 300-pound black sea bass off Jeez. the pier. This was in uh, Point Magoo, California. Yeah. So he was into it, but you know, when you get older sometimes, you, you just have too much going on. He had yeah. a couple of jobs, and trying to be a really good dad, which he su- totally succeeded at. And he was chronically seasick. So Oh, that didn't help him. Yeah, no. He went on a boat, a three-day boat with us uh, out of San Diego. We caught a bunch of albacore. It was so freaking rough. It was brutal. And he literally didn't come out of the stateroom. Jeez. Never came out. In fact, the galley cook looked at him on the last day and said, Who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, who is this guy? And, you know, all night long, I can still remember, it was Paul... 
my dad and I, all you'd see is the light would come out of the stateroom. Somebody would go, give me the bucket. Give me the bucket. <laughs> you know, the trash can. <laughs> and so he couldn't do that. So that was one really great early memory for me. Also, right there by the Redondo Pier, where I used to take you guys before you go to Bishop Montgomery High School. Yeah. In the morning, we'd go Corvina fishing. Mm -hmm. I can see my dad as clear as day. Standing in the water and the grunion swimming through his legs and Paul and I are just like, whoa, you know, just a, another marvel of nature. Just yeah. something that we don't talk about. We most of the time talk about what we caught and the fish that we're after, but it's all that ancillary stuff, you know, the grunion, the birds, the dolphin, the whales, all that stuff, which makes this such a great sport. And then one other thing, uh, we were in Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. I must have been seven or eight years old. They might have been crappie. I don't know what the hell they were, but they were a freshwater fish, and we had these cane poles. Tilapia. Yeah. Maybe tilapia. Yeah, I'm not even sure. Probably were. And it was freaking wide open. That's and I awesome. mean, pretty much Paul and I, like, you know, my mom would say, hey, come on, we're going to a luau. We're like, oh, we're good, you know? Yeah. You know, we just wanted 12 hours a day of catching these things. So that reminds me of, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but Taiwan, dude. Yeah, Taiwan. Right is so freaking awesome with that because we had like those cane poles or something no, of, of that fishing? sort no no no, no. Oh. when we did the tilapia the and they shrimp too, but tilapia, yeah the shrimp the first. shrimp's fun the, the tilapia in taiwan you get like to a pond and it's basically gambling you pay a certain fee to go in there and they have like tilapia tagged yeah and if they have money on them which i don't even know well, if, if we know right we're, how much we were winning yeah, or anything right. <laughs> is it like it's a time so, lot yeah yeah, they're like 30 minutes. To, and you could hammer these fish. He got one. You yeah. got like, did you win any money or did, uh, could you even do I, I don't even broke remember. Broke even or something? Yeah. I think but that the, was the so girl fun. That can that day was really cute. I just said, go ahead, keep it. <laughs> yeah. Wife doesn't speak English. So. And then they have these sh the shrimp ponds where you, you catch your shrimp and then they'll that cook it. Fun. That was so fun. They actually bite your little thing. Really? And you can hammer them. It's so fun, dude. He I fought, would love that. Yeah, yeah. I would, I, the gambling and fish, hell yeah. Oh yeah. my god, dude! I would be broke if we could do that all day. It'd be Why so do we do fun. That here? With what crappie? I don't know. Oh, well, I've maintained that here. I am going to give away my secrets here, but I've maintained that I think it could be viable to open a place in the mall where you have like the Fred Hall trout thing. Yeah. A, a, or the shrimp or something like it where grandpa's walking by with his grandkids and goes oh my god let's take the let's catch some fish, fish yeah and you're in a mall yeah and let's go fishing that my dream was always to open up like a think of like it's a small world at disneyland yeah. like a theme park for fishermen where you get on like some boat that just goes yeah it's my like rob deer deck dream fantasy you know where they yeah fishing. fantasy factory for fishermen and you just get all right you're going to the smallmouth pond hop on here's your bait yeah. or whatever Fish and then what on. you do is you put a bunch of crap in there so they break the lures off and right. you have a tackle shop like there in there and you just raking the dough uh, it sounds like uh when the boys like in the old days they used to say we're gonna go make a drop out here for some rock and they drop in the most hideous <laughs> bottom that would just rip every oh you lost your gig Go down to the galley. Take care of you. <laughs> All right, let's get. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but get back into your story. And so you kind of set up where you kind of got really involved with fishing. That fire kind of was it like right away? You loved it, yeah. or did it, yeah, it, it kind of just clicked. Primal kind of, you know, yeah. The hunter that's in a lot of men. Yeah, you know, it's just. It's, it's weird that some people have that and some people just don't, right? right? And and it's not with. Like hunting, people get that, and fishing. Obviously, some people get that, but it's weird. I don't know. If, do you think if people tried it, people they are wired I've never taken someone fishing and they caught a fish and weren't like stoked. Well, Especially, yeah. if, oh really? Yeah. Like they just hate it. I took Ruth out. Well, she I've, caught a forty pound Dorado. <laughs> I said, "Isn't this fantastic?" And she said, "Can we go in now?" <laughs> That's a different demographic. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, yeah, a guy. Have I ever taken a guy fishing that? Probably not. not unless they're seasick guy. or something. Yeah, yeah. seasick. Yeah, that's that's like supposedly the mis most miserable feeling in the world. It is. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if I was seasick, but I know running a commercial boat when you get no sleep. I was puking, and uh, I was like, "Am I puking because I have had no sleep for three days, or am I puking because I'm seasick? Whatever it is, I wish the boat would sink because I'm yeah. just in this all." That's it. Yeah, but it's cool that like 
I don't think I've ever seen someone catch a fish and not be happy about it when it yeah, comes I to guys. It, yeah, mostly. Uh, I think 98, 99, maybe 100%. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when you're doing top water and stuff like even catching little. I could catch little crappie all day long. I don't know why. It's just in us, I think. <laughs> it's fun. It's like we're rock fishing. We're just laughing the whole time out there. I just got back from a five day on the Independence. There was a guy who was a fly fisherman from I think Montana. Never caught, never gone saltwater fishing. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, he was he learned so much. He did really well, and he loved it. Yeah, well, he's a guy that's already hooked on fishing, but yeah, that transition was easy for him. He loved it. Yeah, there's all. Another thing I kind of want to bring up is like the different types of fishing, right? Because usually you'll get people who are in salt guys or fresh guys or fly fishing guys. But for me, it's been amazing to experience them all because it opens a whole new world of fishing. Yeah. So I, I feel like when you get like these really salty dogs that are on the boat, like, oh, you're catching freshwater bass. That's dumb. It's stupid. But we don't do, do that. You give it a sh- You're missing out on so much fun. Yeah. Like give it a shot it's all interwoven it's all the same get, thing get on fishing. somebody's boat that knows how how you're good at saltwater fishing get with someone who's good at freshwater fishing i'm telling you right now you'll love it most san diego captains and some other guys also even la orange county guys their favorite kind of fishing is freshwater bass fishing. we see a lot of them in the tournaments right so it's, yeah. so it's bruise and yeah. danny Cadota, who i have a show with danny had one that was 21 pounds or mm-hmm. 19 pounds that's insane on a crawdad yeah you know, be clear about that but um yeah i mean those guys all those san diego guys that's what they did when they had free time they didn't yeah. go albacore fishing or bluefin tuna fishing they wanted to go freshwater bass fishing. tino yeah. valentine's out fishing stripers today <laughs> yeah i mean just Tino's don't surf fish him. yeah, yeah I, was a surf. I would say just be open-minded about it because yeah, we yeah, went yeah. to Mont- montana what that guy was doing we fell in love with that right away so much fun right away it's it's fun to and you know what else I've been able to take techniques from different types of fishing and apply them to all the other types oh, too. That's very true. Like the dry dropper on a fly rig, I was tying that today for crappie. Right. But with a what was I throwing a grub and a, a swim ball bait. head swim bait, and we were doubling up yeah. on those crappies. It's so fun. I don't know why a bobber wouldn't work really well in the surf. Like you had a line and a worm, you tossed out, but you beyond the wave, and it's just and the worm is going like, it's got to get bent. Yeah. yeah, especially with those surf perch. If you can get it past yeah. that wave. Yeah, as long as you're not in that type. Yeah, I mean that would work. I would think. And in fact, I wanted to do that at Playa Saldamondo because there's that rocky area. Yeah. You, you make a cast with a sinker, and you, you're, you're hung up every thirty seconds. What if you just had your worm? Yeah, down that jetty. They have that you for. Uh, they do that a lot in Florida. They what do they call it? Um, what's that rig with that orange? The clacker. Oh, it's it's almost all, yeah. It's like a clapper. It's, it's a like clapper a rig. It's an orange. Rig. They set it up to where it's a bobber, but it also spits water if you oh. hit, hit it. Popping yeah. cork. Popping cork. Yeah, that would work great in the yeah. surf. I'd imagine, yeah. especially where you're talking. Yeah, exactly. All right, well now we're talking fishing again. We got to get back to you. Where'd we leave off? So uh, those re- those young experiences, and then I moved to uh, Redondo, where I used to fish. Uh, Pursuit ran out of there. Uh, my brother Paul and I, that's another memory, actually. We had two s- spinning reels, and both of the spinning reels this particular day, we were on the Pursuit, we are albacore fishing, and they were chipped or something. So when the line would pull, it would fray the line. Mm-hmm. And we lost yeah. every freaking albacore we hooked. Oh, and my we were God. up in the bow. And we were hooking. This is our first time ever doing this. Crazy Redondo years, man. I mean, it was insane in those years. Like, I mean, on the way out, we came up bow to bow to the real special. Paul and I are up in the bow and we're like, and all of a sudden some guy hands like eight rods over and some heavy sack guy barely jumps from that bow. Oh, my our God. Bow. He wanted to go straight back out again. Yeah, so, that's crazy funny. stuff. So we lost everything. And we were just bummed out, man. Were, then, were people messing with you about it and all no, that? Oh, no. In fact, what yeah. happened was on the way in, this deckhand named Dave, yeah. I don't remember him, uh, you know, uh, who knows if he's still around, probably not. Uh, Dave walks up to us and goes, here, boys, here's two albacore for you guys. You tried so hard today. And oh, that's blah, cool. Blah, 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 blah. So that's super pitching, cool. You know? Yeah. So that was another thing. And then, so we were set on Redondo, lived in Torrance, California. So Redondo was closed for us. 
And then we fished the half day boats constantly. And those were the days where you fish five hooks, gannons, and you filled every freaking hook with big bacot on a half day, big bacaccio, big reds. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, I didn't even know if there was, I was 12 years old. I didn't know if there was a limit or not. <laughs> I, they said the limit's 15, and I thought it was 15 gunny sacks full. <laughs> I mean, we would literally fill a gunny sack with these things and it was insane fishing that's crazy and both paul and i were good with people you know we we uh, had the gift of gab and so howard warbase a deckhand on there said hey how would you like to uh fish for free from now on and scrub the boat at night we're like hell yeah Damn, all over that's that. awesome yeah well how about you start tonight and oh, do we stay on the boat when everybody gets yeah you stay on then we went back <laughs> into basin three and we felt like big shots we went and got our deck boots the next day and had the big high deck boots and scrubbed the boat. And, you know, that just set off even more of a love for the sport of fishing at that point. Yeah, that's awesome. And so after that, what happens? You are, what, 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 how old are you when you get I that first 12, deck job? I was 12 when that 12 happened. years old. Yeah. Okay. And what would old. be your next big milestone in fishing? Was uh, it like, well, so were you guys, were you and Paul trying to catch specific things or you just going out there and catching fish and having a good time? We were catching whatever was available. But I mean, mm-hmm. we were talking in those days, bluefin tuna in the bay, Santa Monica Bay, big yellowtail. Yeah. Uh, not so much white sea bass. White sea bass made a comeback in the 70s it wasn't very good on sea bass there was yeah. one day where a guy named john dipley had a hundred plus sea bass on a boat Jesus. called the dinah lee at rocky point but that was a flash you know we didn't yeah. see a lot of that but whatever was biting we focused on including when you got back in the harbor you could take a bonita pick which is a feather with a hook that has no barb on it yeah and you know i'd say hey paul why don't you pick uh, a trash can full of bonita and drag it up to quality seafood this is all illegal Okay, you know, yeah. I'm just telling you how it was in those days. Why don't you pick, or well, let's pick pick it together, and you just do figure eight in the trash can, drag it up to quality seafood, and make fifty bucks or twenty five bucks or whatever. I mean, it was a lot of money in those days for yeah, kids. heck yeah, yeah. Hey, and you kind of touched on it. Where was that? How far out of the harbor were you going to catch albacore, bluefin? Or where, how far out were you going? So albacore was pretty much where we fish them now. Mm-hmm. You know, forty three. Uh, the Pyramid Head, Clemente. I don't remember catching any albacore any closer than that until 1983 when they showed up in the channel. Uh, albacore showed up in the channel in 83, I believe it was. It was in the fall, and they were straight. They were fished to 80 pounds. Jesus. Albacore. Wow. And they would not bite the heavy. They would only bite like 12 pounds. Oh, really? Pounds. So you're on a fish for three hours. Yeah. There was a lot of them caught there. So what happened with those things? Are they coming back, you think, ever? Albuquer- or? Uh, it's oceanography. Yeah. It's, the oceanography has to be right for them. And that includes bait availability, water temperature, you know, chlorophyll. All of those factors have to drive. And I thought this year it would happen. And then when they caught, they caught one or two and probably had 10 fish this year. Yeah. We throw in private boater catches. But that still didn't happen. It was mostly up north of us around Fort Bragg. We saw pretty good albacore fishing up there. But... Yeah, they'll be back. Uh, yeah. I asked Frank Lopreste, who knows, has way more knowledge than I have my pinky about this. I asked him this year, are we going to see Albuquerque this year? He said, hmm, I don't know, but they'll be back. But that's usually a fall deal, no, would you say? No, it is a, you know, the traditional time used to be before you had sonars, before you had water temperature, anything else. The boats in San Diego would be fishing on the Coronado Islands, catching hundreds of yellowtail. And then they'd say, time to put the jig lines on the boat July 4th and go out and do an exploratory. Mm. So they went out there blind. Wow. And then, hook up! <laughs> you know, and threw some bait. And, hey, it's albacore season. So July 4th through the fall. And then many times it would move to areas like Morro Bay. Yeah. Up there. And, of course, you know, central, a lot of years, was Ensenada, Baja, mm. California, yeah. Mexico. So there's a place called the Inner Bank, and that's very close to Ensenada, right there. So those guys could come out of there and wallop them. San Diego boats ran down there and walloped them. Then they'd move up toward Pyramid Head at Clemente. Uh, Sometimes they'd be out on Tanner. There was a time, tracing my career a little bit, where I ran a boat called the Thunderfish. Yeah. When I was like 20, I was going to Loyola, so I ran it it in the summertime. And we were out on Tanner Bank. And we were catching tons of rock. Rick Effinger was there, who owns Marina Del Rey Sport Fishing. And 
who see a bird school. And when you're fishing rock cod, you're making money. It is fun. But, you know, if you see, like, service stuff going on, I know we used to have the radio on, and you'd hear Eddie McEwen on the Pacific Queen come up and say, yeah, we just had two jig fish and 26 bait fish. And you're just like, man. I want to go do that. Yeah. yeah. So we see this bird school. We roll up on it. And I'm looking, and Rick's looking, and I go, what the hell? And it was this, like, swirl of red, something red. Yeah. Just swirl. It was these little tiny bokashio with albacore just going, choo, choo, Jesus. Choo. And we're like, oh, let's do this. <laughs> and so we threw on a bunch of albies. I Dang. think Rick had a lift pole, and we lifted some fish. And <laughs> it's yeah. got to be a blast. Oh, my God. It was so much fun. So I have another question. There's a whole generation of young fishermen who haven't had that experience with the albacore? My first experience, I would think I was four years old when I caught one. Yeah, that was yeah. the last time I caught one, right? Probably, right? Or no? Oh no, because that was your. Oh, was I eight friend? years old? No, no you your were first, four. your first uh, one was four. Yeah, we had, tracer. We still had a Steve couple Thompson. years after that. Of, of yeah, because we're good. on the Polaris Supreme. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So my question is, what's the difference between albacore and bluefin? Is it a more fun bite? Is it kind of the same deal? Is it a better eating fish? Just kind of go over the differences for our younger audience who sure. hasn't been in a wide open album. It's bite. funny you say this because Shane Thompson, who ran the independence on our five day trip, the Freeman Adventures five day trip, his very first time running the rig. Yeah. And he came up to me and he goes, you know, I got to tell you something. I've never seen an albacore. Really? Go, yeah. You're cracking me up. Now you're making me feel prehistoric, dude. <laughs> uh, you know, he knew that I had predicted all that stuff and everything else. Well, it's kind of subjective. You yeah. Know, a lot of people. With everything, yeah. A lot of people, when I start talking albacore, say, well, you got these big bluefin. Why are you trying to wish them away? I'm not trying to wish anything away. Yeah. What is going to happen is going to happen, no matter what I say. Mm -hmm. So albacore have a tendency to bite really really well where bluefin they, they can be finicky crazy. yeah but when albies come to the boat man then you can throw on a hundred in a half hour really yeah i mean they bite full speed not all the time and we used to say when they mixed with bluefin albacore and bluefin used to mix together albacore would get finicky and it's almost like guys would say they're acting like bluefin like almost like the bluefin are they're teaching, teaching them, them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah which you know who knows if that's true or not um albacore prefer that cooler water temperature, 63.5 is a water temp that's perfect for albacore. Yeah. Uh, you can catch them in 70, 72 degree water, but they like that 63, 65, 66 degree water. Bluefin have the ability to regulate their body temperature. In fact, when they get into dark, when they get deep and it's dark, yeah. they can flow more blood to their eyes huh. so they can see better. That's crazy. So they're very, very unique in that way. Um, albacore. Just some of the <laughs> finest eating fish I have ever had in my life. Now, is, so uh, can good. you sashimi that, or is, is that more more your canned tuna in the grocery store type of deal? Or what What do you do? What, how would you cook yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, we used to cook it all the time, and guys, like, my mom did not like fish. She loved that. Uh, guys at school, they, they would go, what is this, like steak? Or, yeah. So, you know, you can can it, which is a great way. Jalapenos. You put whatever you want in there. Jalapeno. I used to do jalapenos. You can sashimi it. Albacore sashimi is great. You can sear it, which is another great way to cook it. One of my favorite ways was you take your albacore, you bacon wrap it, and then you grill it, and then you put it in a mixture of fresh lemon, butter, garlic, and oregano, and just kind of make sure it's all covered in that. Yeah. Oh. My God, don't overcook it. Yeah. And it was to die for. You and, could end cold, like the next day, just take a chunk of that. So freaking delicious. And so you say they bite kind of a little bit better. Does that mean you're throwing heavier line than you would usually? Or it, how, what's the rig set up? Same as a bluefin? or Most of the time you can fish heavier line. I'll give you an example of that. Scott Mizell was a deckhand on board the Pegasus. Joe Chait was running the boat. Scott now owns the Condor. I think he's retired almost. So yeah. I met him when he was a kid. Uh, and he was on deck. And he says to me one day, or Joe, one of those two. I, th I thought it was Scott, though. He goes, Phil. We're in a wide open bite on albacore. Joe Chait was standing in the stern with a garden hose going, shh, 
just spraying it in the water. It looks like fish are boiling. Yeah. And he's just going like this, and they're just full speed. He goes, try the cranium hook. And I go, the cranium hook? What are you talking about? And he goes, look. And he had a freaking 14 hook. Yeah. For, like this. Jesus. Like this. And you pin an anchovy on it oh with 100 pounds. And he goes, when you swing on them, it goes right up into their cranium, and they're done. Wow. That's really? crazy. Are you kidding me? Put it in the water. Don't let them get their head. Just whine. Get them to the boat. And pray that you have a deck hand there to gaff it because once they get their head, they're and taking you're it off. down on 100 pound, you're about to get your butt kicked. <laughs> you're about to get screwed. So, I mean, that kind of exemplifies how crazy it can get or lift balls. I think I remember us catching them on candy wrappers. Snickers. Yeah. Bars. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. Supreme? Yeah. 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 We'd throw it out like a surface iron and they'd come smoke it. Do you guys have any memory of being up in the bow and just seeing them swim out and eat your bait? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, I I remember that. The most vivid vivid memory I have from the Supreme is Rothery calling me up to the top deck. And this is before I even had polarized sunglasses. I didn't even know what they were. I was a kid. And he goes, look out there. You see all that? And I'm I'm looking. I don't have the sunglasses on. I go, yeah, it's big kelp line there, right? And he goes, no, put these on. And I put them on, and it's just hundreds of yellowtail. It looked like kelp. Oh, that was Cedro. Yeah, I remember yeah, that too. Right? Yeah, and I just remember seeing, and I remember, uh, I go down to the bait tank. The deck hand goes here. Put this on. Gives me a big mackerel. I throw it on eighty pound on a big hook. Throw it out there, and I remember getting bit. As soon as it hit the water, it was on, and I put it in gear. Snapped eighty pound. Dang, yellow. I had I hooked one of those huge yellows that deck hand told me. The deck hand told me the I hooked a seal. And he told me it was a yellow and pissed me off. Oh, right. Because I was whining on that thing. Forever. And then, like, right at dusk, I hooked another one that felt like a seal. And he goes, it's yellow, man. And I go, yeah, right. Here, you you deal with it then. And he relt it in. It was like a 55-pound yellow tear. I was like, <laughs> Jesus. That same trip, I remember someone hooking a seal, almost losing a thumb because it was wrapped in the braid. Uh-huh. Oh, my I God. I remember that. Who was that? I forget. Uh-huh. I, I remember I shut the door on Chucky's finger. Chucky's finger. Oh, yeah. Right. I thought you might have been mixing that up. No? No, 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 no. I remember specifically a guy in the back with a seal on, and his, he's going, cut the line, cut the line. Jesus. And, oh, my God. And then I remember, um, what was the other thing I remembered? I forget. Bow jumping was insane. Bow jumping. Us. Hey, well, I can't believe they oh, let us do that. That was fun. The main I, shark. Oh, is that what it was? You remember the yellows coming up and hitting the mako oh, shark yeah. in the stomach? And yeah. the mako shark was throwing up. Oh, yeah. That eating, was so weird, dude. They were eating the... Yeah, oh, yellows do that a lot. That's so weird. Yeah. It was a big mako, but I think that thing was so stuffed it wasn't able to get away, so it just sat there and took it until it threw up. We should look out in the camera right now and say hi to Tommy Rothery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's up, Tommy? Miss Shout Tommy. out, Tommy Rothery. Some of the best times in our lives. Right? And, and I didn't want to glance over the bow jumping because... Uh, Bow jumping for you, if you don't know, it's when the bow of the boat goes over a wave and then you jump as it's coming down. We're not so recommending anybody do to not do not do this. Do it. But for us, we were we good. <laughs> you know, I remember me and Philip jumping and our laying on the ceiling. We were laying on the ceiling. Our backs oh, were up on the, the ceiling. Yeah, in the state room. Did you ever do it in the bow? Yes. Dude, the, you, That's scary in the I bow. I, I don't I didn't like tell. that. No, I don't I'm not gonna tell any particular story other than I caught some air with my brother a few times where you're way above the rail and you're like, gee, uh, is this a mistake? Yeah. It, well, obviously. It's scary. It is, yeah. That's how I felt on the ceiling. Like, I, oh, my God. I heard a story, and it's probably bullshit, but I heard a story where I guess the deck it was really, really rough, and he was bow, screwing around in the bow, bow jumping, and he went over the wheelhouse into the tank. <laughs> I don't know. That's a, I would love to have that on video. Yeah, that's, so yeah. that's a good one. That's hilarious. All right, so let's keep continuing your story. Yeah, yeah. I think we're getting to. I like. I love jumping off track, though. It's yeah, fun. sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, you were twelve. Now we're getting into your high school years. Yeah, high school years. So I fished a lot. Rick went to uh, Bishop Montgomery. Um, I applied for something called work experience in my senior year which I just went down to Barney Barnes, who ran the Redondo Special. I go, hey, Barney, can you sign this thing? He goes, what is it? Oh, well, you didn't even say, what is it? He goes, sure, sure. Yeah. Signed it. And what it was was I would be working in the last two periods of school, and then I'd get a grade for that. I'm like, what the hell? You That's the easiest like? grade ever, yeah. This or, you know. Sit in class. Algebra. Yeah. yeah. I'm in. That's yeah. what I did with sports. I was like, yeah. just put me on whatever team. So I did that. So that meant on... 
Every day, I was done at 11.30 at Bishop. 11.30 a.m., my day was over at Bishop. Where other kids like, what are you doing? Yeah, they're like, you know, then I go, oh, I'm going to go home and catch some sleep, you know, because we played street hockey constantly also. You know? <laughs> so I go, I'm going to get a nap. I'll see you at Walteria Park and watch yeah. a street hockey game. Uh, so, and, you know, whenever there was work available or I could fish, we would go. But a lot of times, weekdays, you know, there was no boat. There was not enough people to run. So I kept fishing during my high school years, uh, surf fishing, going to Mexico. Paul and I, I'm pretty sure I was 17, 18, when yeah. I approached my mom and dad and said, hey, we're thinking about driving down to Mexico. And, you know, Uncle Jack, there was this guy, Uncle Jack, hey, those banditos will cut your head off. Yeah. You know, and scaring the hell out of us. Like, I'm like, hey, well, what should we do? And she goes, yeah, you just go for it. Yeah. So we basically, like, you know, we have a map of Baja and, like, a gallon water bottle. Yeah. <laughs> and our fishing rods. And choom, off we went, man. We went to TJ, uh, hung out in TJ for a little bit, and then drove to Laredo. I'm going to. Very first time down there. I'm going to. All the way to Laredo. Sidetrack you sure. again here. So <clears throat> you have a unique perspective on Mexico, right? Yeah. You've been there so many times. And uh, your perspective is that it's very safe to travel. Would you say that? Or would you say it's very safe to travel if you know where you're going and yes. you can speak Spanish? Um, is speaking Spanish a must no. to travel down to Mexico? No. Okay. No. So what, would you, what, what advice would you give someone who's never been to Mexico? And you've kind of heard the same thing all throughout the years about Mexico. Has that changed? Is it the same? The same. Yeah. Same thing. So what, what do people say and what do you advise? So people What's say, the narrative? People say you're going to get your head cut off. Still. You're so you're 17. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, have you heard that before? When yeah, you yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's dangerous. It's blah, blah, blah. Cartel. All that stuff is real. That yeah. Cartel violence is all real. Mm -hmm. And all that stuff that goes on. Um, pretty much every single time there is some violence on an American, it's because that American is somewhere where you shouldn't be. Okay. Yeah. You, if you're going to the red light district in TJ, Northern Tijuana, that's a very dangerous part of town. I know a lot of guys go down there. They go to the Hong Kong club and they go to blah, 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 blah. That's a dangerous part of town. Okay. Most of the time you're going to be fine down there. There's a lot of cops. And that kind of stuff. But it's a dangerous part of town. If you stay in the touristy areas, you're going to be fine. You go mm -hmm. to the restaurants that are good. You go to um, those you know, fishing venues. You're going to be fine. But if you get off in those wrong areas, you can get in trouble. There was a guy. Um, I don't remember his name. I, I, I don't want to get into that. But mm -hmm. he was running a long range. He was the captain of a long range boat. Yeah. In Cabo San Lucas. And... Um, he got shot in the face mm -hmm. one night. And so one newspaper guy, who I won't mention either because he's a friend, but he got on this whole thing about, um, see, he's been saying, it's, yeah. I told you it was dangerous. Now an American captain gets shot in the face, blah, 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 blah. Well, I had a source down there in the government, still a good friend of mine. And I was talking to her and she goes, be patient, okay? Just give me till the morning, okay? Yeah. So she sent me the police report. And the police report said that he was in the red light district at 3 o'clock in the morning, tested positive for cocaine, and refused to press any charges against the guys who did it. Hmm. So the, the, the idea is if you're doing cocaine and you're in the red light district, bad things might are happen. probably going to happen to you. Yeah. You know? The one the one of the taco guys, I think you asked him, just like a taco vendor in Mexico, said one of the wisest things I've ever heard. Yeah. You asked, what do you think about Mexico to a local guy there? And he just goes, like, you asked if it, is if it's safe or not. He just says, if you want trouble, you can find it. I remember. Where was that? That was like in Rosarito. It was yeah. all of us. We yeah. were all there. Yeah. Jessica. Which is and, something you can find in L.A., Chicago, sure. New York. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you got to think. I mean, a lot of my Mexican friends, when people say you're going to get your head cut off in Mexico, they're like, "Didn't 50 people just get shot in Chicago mm -hmm. over last weekend?" Yeah, they're like almost a little offended by it. You know what I mean? Because really, I mean, you got to look at the statistics about tourists, and not that many. You can get caught in a crossfire. Don't get me wrong. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if a cartel is putting a hit on a rival gang and there's those turf wars going on. Especially Usually that's not in the touristy yeah, areas, yeah, right? That's not area. going, yeah. yeah. You're on the hills of Tijuana. It has happened, but you're right. It's mm-hmm. up there in La Gloria and places like that. I recently, not that long ago, was in TJ and I was going to visit an orphanage. Because some guy, I forget who it was, told me, you should go visit this orphanage. They need your help. Yeah. So I was in Plaza Azteca Hotel. And I said, hey, where the hell is this place? And uh, I showed them the address. They go, oh, my God, that's like 45 minutes away. I'm thinking, I didn't even know TJ was that big, you know, right? Yeah. 45 minutes. And he goes, hey, that's that's cartel land. Uh, I'd be very careful out there. I go, really? And he goes, don't get out of your car. Don't. If you If you get lost... Go to a gas station or, you know, an Osco, uh, uh, 7-Eleven kind yeah. of store. So I'm lost. Yeah, of course, right? Yeah. I'm totally lost. And I'm parked on the side of the street. And I'm looking at this woman selling tacos. And I'm just looking. And I finally say to myself, there's no way that woman is not a decent woman. Yeah. So I walk out and I say, excuse me, you know where this orphanage is? And she goes, oh, I've heard of that. Ijo, she calls to her son, do you know where this is? And he goes, man, I've heard of it too. She goes, hold on, let me make a phone call. So she makes a phone call. She goes, my girlfriend's coming. She'll take you there. So a little red flag. Yeah. You know, like, but I'm still looking at this person. And my gut is telling me, I could be totally wrong, by the yeah. way. I'm not recommending you go. And so the girl shows up and she goes, can I get in your car and show you where it is? And I said, Sure. So turn left, turn right, go this way, go that way. You know, I'm going right into the the ambush. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what's in my mind. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not even doing that. I'm going straight to the fucking border. Right, <laughs> exactly. And so she goes, there it is. And there, here's this orphanage. It says, I forget what the name of it was. And I go, hey, well, thank you so very much. And I hand her 20 bucks. And she said, hey, wait, are you going to come? Or what are you doing? Are you going to bring clothing? Are you going to bring teach English, and I was toying with the idea of teaching English there, Yeah, especially if I relocated to Baja. I said, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure. And she goes, and I looked at her, and I looked at her shoes. I looked at everything. She was poor. Yeah. She had no money. And she said, just promise me you'll teach me English if you come back. She wouldn't take the 20 bucks. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, how yeah. crazy is that? Yeah. So even in the midst of all that. So the point is, you you, you sh- you need to do your research before you go because you do not want to drive into one of those areas. And it's easy to do, right? Like you yeah. can get lost very easily. Easily, I yeah. get lost still in time. Me too. All the time. <laughs> Dude, I get lost sucks. here. Yeah. yeah, I get lost all the time. So you just need, to, or go with somebody. Like you know, a caravan. We should yeah. go a caravan and take people down there. Which shop. you've done before. Yeah, yeah. All okay. right. So you you're, are. Go by ahead. the way, a couple things more. You know, in Costa Rica, I. When I uh, met Ruth, she was doing something one day. I go, "Hey, can I walk around here? Is it safe?" She goes, "Yeah, it's perfectly safe." And I, you know, I'm like to the, you know, I figure I, there was no life insurance, so she wasn't trying to get me knocked off. <laughs> and the hotel girl said, "Yeah, no problem." Well, th- this was another one of my weight loss periods. Yeah, I was walking 400 miles a day. Yeah, I walked in to one of the worst barrios in all the. Uh, they had uh, a gang called the Chapolinas, yeah, grasshoppers, and. Um, Brutal gang. And I walked into that area. And I'm like, hey, this feels weird here. You so can I, feel it. You can feel yeah. it. So I turned around and started coming back. And a kid walks out of the bushes in front of me. And he's just standing there. 15 years old, maybe. Wow. And I start walking toward him. And I said, ¿Puedo ayudarte? Can I help you? And before he answered me, I started pedaling backwards. And out came this huge blade. Jesus. Just missed me. And then he's chasing me. And so I just turn around and start running. And I'm like looking like rock, stick, something to defend myself with. And then I look back and he's on the street corner laughing. Damn. And I go, you pinchy. You know, I started and I go, wait, this is not a good idea either. Yeah. And some guy goes, hey, I'll help you. And then he runs over and he tackles this and he starts beating. And I go, no, 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 no. This was some guy going to the market for eggs. Oh, my God. <laughs> beat the hell out of some guy. That- <laughs> And so, yeah, that was a close call. So there's bad, I mean, like Philip pointed out, Los Angeles, uh, anywhere you're going to find. You just have to be really careful. And the other thing that I will admonish you all about, everybody should take a class on mordida, which in Spanish means bite, Mm -hmm. which is when the cops stop you. That was my next question. That's my big knock on Mexico. You got 
A lot of, not a, I would say it's common where the cops pull you over and they're doing a little money cash shake down. What's your advice on that? It's happened to me for sure. Man, I didn't listen to my advice. What? You would have put your money in your sock. <laughs> well, I do that. You got to have some money in your wallet, though. Yes. Yeah, 20, you got to leave 100 bucks. bucks in there or whatever, just so that you yeah. open yeah. the wallet in front of them. Yeah, and you got see money. That's all you got. Yeah. yeah. What would you advise someone? Because that could be a very scary it's thing for terrifying. somebody who's Especially never been there. So if you don't speak English, don't understand how the legal system works there. Yeah. There's you with a Tijuana jail cell. Right. And there's no, they're, they're under Napoleonic law. There's mm-hmm. no writ of habeas corpus, which means here you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. There, you're, guilty. you're presumed guilty until proven innocent. So that's all scary stuff. Yeah. Um, recently, uh, well, I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you about what you definitely, bringing any kind of firearm or even a bullet in your car. Yeah. Anything like that will end you in La Mesa Penitentiary. For at least a few years, and you do not want to spend any time there, man. It's brutal. Mm. Talk to people who've been in there for a few years. Um, I can tell you what I do and then kind of extrapolate from that. So I speak good Spanish, decent enough Spanish, and I understand the whole game. Yeah. If I did something illegal, then I'm going to try to buy myself out. That's one of the beauties. That's the other side of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the other side of it. That You know, here, you're going to end up in court or you're going to, you know, whatever. There, here, it's 100 bucks. Sorry, you know, mm-hmm. if I didn't do what they're talking about, I just look them straight. They'll start, well, you're going to have to follow us into the station. And, and I'm great. I can't wait to meet your boss. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. I had two Tijuana cops try to pull this on me recently with a guy who was scared crapless. And I told him. So I was driving, you know that when you first go into Mexico and you're driving up that long road before you make that right mm-hmm. to Rosarina on the toll roads? Yeah. That long stretch. And I'm driving up that stretch and I see this cop come out. And I just saw him come out. He hadn't lit up or anything. And I go, this guy's going to light us up and he's going to try to extort us for money. Watch your cash. Okay? Yeah. So he pulls us over, has me go to the front of the car, put my hands, has him go to the front of the car. I know what's going on. They're going to search the car and hope, hopefully there's some cash in there. Um, and so I was smiling and laughing. He goes, what's so funny? And I go, no, nothing. And he goes, I go, I'm looking forward to telling your boss what a great job you do. And he goes, really? And I go, yeah, uh, I'm going to need your name and your badge number. He's just like looking at me like, you a-hole. And then so he goes, you got any drugs? You got I go, no, 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 I wasn't speeding, wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, whatever, you know. And so... Pretty soon, he looks at me, and he hands me my driver's license. Pretty much like, I'm going to go find another gringo that's easier than you. This yeah. is too much trouble. And so off we go. And I you know, looked at the guy that was with me. I said, you yeah, know, you okay? And he said, yeah, yeah. You know, I was, we get to Rosarita Beach. He left his wallet in the car. Oh, and they got him. Yeah, they took 400 bucks Damn. out of his wallet. I go, dude, I told you. You know, I had my wallet in my front pocket, and, you know, if he was going to steal the money, he was going to do it right in front of me, and then I was driving straight to, and who knows what happens at that point. I've yeah. heard some horror stories about it. I've heard some other, you know, here's 100 bucks and you're out of it. Um, so that's me. I speak Spanish. I've lived in Mexico. I understand all that. If you don't speak Spanish. That's my next what, what, question. What, 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 what's, what do you we get there? Yeah. yeah. Why are these police officers doing that? Are they money? Right. Yeah. What are they making as so, a police officer? They're not making. Like, they're not making money like a police officer. No. Here. Now I. There's do, still no excuse for that, in my opinion. But there's still a drive behind it. They got. Was, they got that power, and they're using it. Yeah. No, I understand, but I don't right. think the government wants that going on. Yeah. Um, I don't think they for care. tourism. You know that kind of culture is a part of Mexico in many ways. Yeah. Um. You know, I remember when I was younger, I knew what the cops made. So I don't know what they make anymore. I could mm-hmm. figure it out. I'm guessing 30 bucks a day. Yeah. 40 bucks a day. It used to be seven bucks a day. Dang, that's crazy. Yeah. And they, they just have that power to where they, they know, hey, I'm good for the next two weeks if I make this stop or whatever. Oh, my God. They're making big money, actually, yeah. some of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big money. <clears throat> so, yeah, my next one more question, and we'll yeah. move on. Someone who doesn't have your temperament, someone who's a little more timid, someone who's going down there for the first time. What do they do 
when they get pulled over? How do they prepare for that traffic stop? Should they prepare for that traffic stop like it's going to happen ahead of time? Yeah. Um, so when you first get pulled over, I would do what you do in the U.S. pretty much. In other words, you might turn your car off, take your keys, put them on the dash, put your hands on the steering wheel, do all the same stuff you should do here. Cop walks up on you here. I always look at it from the cop's point of view. Mm -hmm. That's a scary thing. So if he sees my hands on there and I'm not going to drive away, he's a little more at ease. Yeah. And you don't want to give many excuses. I mean, I would not carry very much cash on me, number one. So you don't, you can't get screwed out of that much. Mm -hmm. I would try to make it. Cause most of those guys are somewhat bilingual. Yeah. Because they have to be to extort money from you. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would just make it clear that. I didn't do anything wrong, and I'm happy to go to the police station with you. Let's go. Yeah. You know. Now, if you don't want someone who's timid, might not want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're then they're gonna either have to say I don't have any money, or, or here's forty bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Buy your way out of it, which, you know, I mean, it's that's sad. what happened to me in uh, where was I? Puerto Nuevo, I think, or something. But yeah. I was late to the airport. Right. This guy stopped me for running a stop sign. There wasn't a stop sign for the last three miles or, or whatever. Sometimes they're behind a damn truck. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, and stop sign. I, this guy just had me dead to rights because I was going to miss my flight. And I just go, I Did opened. you let him know you had a flight? Yeah. No, no, no I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I, I told him, let's go back to the station. Yeah. That's that whole deal. And then I... I looking at my phone like, God, I got to get out of this now. Yeah. And I just had 40 bucks in my wallet. And I go, hey, dude, here's my wallet. 40 bucks in there yours and he goes all right see you later i think that would be just put 40 in your in your wallet be prepared for the stop don't be nervous right. act like you've been there before yep and uh make eye contact don't take your eyes yeah. don't you know once you you know it's a whole thing if you keep yeah. staring at them and smile you know like i'm smirking and and i'm doing that with a thousand cars going by me mm -hmm. i'm not so sure i would do that on some road out in a road yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Because I might get my teeth bashed out. You yeah. Know? I, I've never had that happen before. Yeah. It's a fine line to walk down Finish there. that story. What? Where you got pulled over. What about it? You go to the airport. I go to the airport. Then they try to take my rod. It's my grandpa's rod that I love so much. Right. And I'm like freaking out. And they're telling me to check it. The lady at the front told me I can't check it. Is this Mexico? Then I'm going, or yeah. This Airlines. is Mexico, Mexico. yeah. Then they're like, we're going to take this from you. And I said, I'll miss my flight. I don't care. And then they shot me right through. Oh, we had that happen on a cruise. Same rod. It's, it's a little travel. They're always trying to take now. Grandpa's rod. Oh, man. And I had the... The, the G. Loomis. Loomis. It's bad. Oh, <laughs> it's, really it's, it's, really I don't even know if they make them. Gary Great. Loomis is going to be on my show in December. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Tell That's him. Be awesome. We'll test his product out for him. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I will. That guy doesn't need us. Yeah. <laughs> his rod speaks for itself, but... We're getting on a cruise line in Mexico, and this guy goes, I heard him say, thank God it spoke Spanish. Yeah. I heard him speak to a woman that was there. He goes, I'm getting that rod. Yo quiero este... Uh, uh, Caña. Caña. And I heard him say that, and as soon as I got up there, they go, yeah, you can't bring that. And I go, I need your supervisor now, in Spanish. Yo quiero hablar con tu jefe. I said it straight in Spanish. They're like, well, wait a minute. You just can't... Ha and I go, I want to talk to your boss. I heard you say... Yeah. You want this rod, you're not getting it. Right. And they just looked at me with a frown and said, go ahead. Yeah, right. Right. Now, I think it's important. While all of this is a reality in Mexico, the people of Mexico 100%. are the best people you'll ever hang out with. Yeah. Heck, you went to a Halloween party one time down there. So and, much fun. And you, you know, was, weren't you in, I mean, you were uh, alone pretty much. Yeah, yeah, I went to, it was like a Papa's and beer Oh. Halloween party, I would 100% recommend it to anybody that's of partying age. It was the coolest party ever. You know what was insane to me? Three quarters of that crowd was white. Oh, really? They were all from San Diego. Everybody. I was like, because I'm always under the impression people are so scared to go to Mexico. But right. Everybody was uh, partying. At, it was a, such a sick party, dude. Yeah. Because like Papa's and Beer, they have that little small area, but they opened up like a giant concert venue for that. And I had so much fun. It was a blast. I went to bed. Because we, didn't we hike Coronel that day? Yeah. We hiked. Yeah, I think that Were day. Were we shooting the fireworks off on the beach with Bubba and everybody? Was that after I we, think so. We had dinner know. at Tony Lozano's? Was that another time? I don't know. They're all merged together. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
But I can tell you this. Some of the most fun I've ever had in my life was in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, so. and that whole thing wasn't to bash Max. It's just, no, 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 no. No, it's, it's just trying to honest, inform people. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I think there's great parts of Mexico and there's bad parts of Mexico. Like everywhere else in the world. The good exactly. Times in Mexico, Everybody has different cultures. Outweigh the bad times by far. Oh, yeah. Those experiences, going back. those cop experiences, I probably had two or three. I don't go as much as you. I'm sure you've had dozens, right, or something. You know, honestly, probably if I had to say since I've been going for 50 years... I would probably say 10. 10. That's insane. Yeah. 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 One every five years. Yeah. That's, and then, and that's the only thing that can kind of put a damper on the trip. Everything else is amazing. Yeah. I, I do want to make clear I was with a guy and we were trying to get through a bunch of stuff for an orphanage. So Mexico will tax that stuff. Yeah. So we try to sneak it through. So we, we, you know, I mean, if they stop and see that stuff, they're going to search the whole car. Yeah. So we went through, uh, we went through and we get through and like, right when we get through, I look at him and I go, yeah, <laughs> man, we did it. Let's head to the orphanage and we'll give all this stuff out. And so the guy pulls over cause he's got to take a leak. He's oh taking a no. Leak, and I look in his glove compartment and there's six bullets Oh no! in his glove compartment. And I go, Hey, are you freaking kidding me? And he goes, what, what's the big deal? And I go, we're freaking in La Mesa Penitentiary. If they found any of that stuff and then searched the whole car back there, we're in La Mesa, man. Do you understand? He goes, oh, I didn't, I had no idea. And I go, you cannot have anything. Like a fire took him and threw him out the window. Like, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, my God. And, yeah, La Mesa is not a fun place to be in. In fact, I don't think they have, they may have a few cells there, but you're pretty much outside. And you better have some money to buy your food with. You got money and, and protection, probably too. You better have some money to find some big bad guy. Yeah, or you know that's going to be crazy. Which reminds me, I don't know why we're spending so much time on Mexico. But one well, more that's thing. a big part of your history. Well, one more thing. Uh, there was some brutal stuff going on in Mexico at one time, and Hugo Torres, who owns the Rosarito Beach Hotel, was the mayor. Pete Thomas was an L.A. Times writer. So I pulled you guys out of school. Yeah, I remember he was all freaked oh, out. Wasn't he freaked out or no? Right? Was he freaked out about going, Pete? Yeah, yeah, yeah because we he lost was. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> he was a little freaked out, but um, I almost like to hear it from your eyes. We walked in to have lunch with Senor Torres. Yeah. And you can describe what, you, you know, we're sitting down, lovely lunch. Rosarita Beach Hotel is a great place, but... Remember, I don't know if you remember, we were driving. There was no cars on the road. Like it was yesterday. No people. Be- why, yeah. why was that? We yeah. had an escort, too, from the border. Yeah. I mean, because so, there was and, a lot of cartel but, violence going on. And the reason that, that we were going to meet with Hugo and the cartel stuff, and we had this big escort, is because Hugo took a stand against the cartel. Yes. And that was a big no-no for yes. any government official. He had a bulletproof do. vehicle yes. and... So, and we went into that Rosarito Hotel for the meeting. We weren't part of the meeting. We were too young. Do you remember that? No, I remember we were eating dinner and we or eating, lunch we with Hugo dinner, and yeah, everything. And lunch. Yeah. Uh, I, t- I totally remember it. I just remember seeing the meanest, biggest, baddest Mexicans I've ever seen in my life. And I remember this one guy just walking. He I, Straight out of an action movie. Yeah. Sunglasses on inside, standing there like this, big... Surrounding guy, us. Surrounding us. And he had this big black trench coat. And I just remember him moving a little bit to where his trench coat opened up. And he had two Uzis yeah. in his belt. And I'm going, what the fuck are He's we He's going, going, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember we us? sat down and started eating. Yeah. And they kind of were in the shadows still. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then you look up all of a sudden. You're like, oh, shit. They're <laughs> There's everywhere. A lot of big guys yeah, I was here. Like, How the fuck are we supposed are to we gonna gonna get hit? Ellis? Yeah, I was like, are we going to get hit with like a bullet <laughs> right <laughs> now? <laughs> We need to snipe Hugo right through the freaking window oh or something. My God. But yeah, Hugo was awesome, man. He was he was such Still a good is. dude. Yeah, mm. yeah, that was crazy. And his wasn't daughters it? are awesome. Yeah, that was such a cool cool moment. Great lunch. That was good. Rosarito Beach still putting out good lunches. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. And then in Tijuana, there were fifteen decapitations that same day. Yeah, and, and we, then we Thomas locked. Pete. Freaked out. <laughs> we were in a Pemex gas station, and we locked Pete Thomas in the. In the bathroom, in the <laughs> and he was like trying to stand up on the sink, and he was going yelling out the window. Are you the me? Are you the me? Help me! Help me! And we finally let him out. You know? Poor Pete. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's get back to 
wherever we were with high your, your life. All right, back to high school. So then I ran the commercial boat for a couple of years, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, we had several near-death experiences, as you might imagine. <laughs> you know? uh, the boat is cracking. The boat is cracking was a smaller other commercial boat. Uh, yeah, that was we were at Santa Barbara Island. I crawled down in the chain locker. I was, had the flu so bad. How old are you guys? 17, 16, 17. 17. SBI? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were always pushing the limits. Yeah. We're at Santa Barbara Island in a skiff. It was pretty much an 18-foot skiff, this one. And um, I'm down in the chain lock. I was so sick. had a really bad fever. And I hear Paul and Rick Santella out there every two seconds. Oh, another one. Oh, shoot. Oh, wow. You know, and I'm like, oh, man, we're at least we're making money. And yeah, we're gonna yeah. be, it'll be the payday. Well, when I finally crawled out of there, they had like three blue perch and a white fish. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is all this? What are you guys yelling about? <laughs> well, we, I don't, you know. <laughs> so coming home, we were pounding so heavily. All we had was a compass. We got way off track. <laughs> and Santella is yelling up in the bow, the boat is cracking. <laughs> the boat is cracking. So we pulled it back a little bit. We ended up in San Pedro. We missed Redondo. I was so sick that I just, like, take me home, you know? Dock it, Called the owner of the boat and said, hey, your boat's in San Pedro. (laughs) Good luck. We're not even sure where it is, buddy. (laughs) And uh, so that was that. Uh, There was another funny one that I'll tell you on the Thunderfish. We were fishing Tanner Bank, and this guy, Gordon Stewart, he's dead. He got hit by a truck uh, not that long ago. Good guy. Funny guy. Yeah. And um, he weighed, like, 350 pounds. Big guy. And he was just seasick as hell. So, of course, you know, my brother and I being commercial fishermen and sensitive to his needs, we're laughing and like, oh, oh you know, you big wimp, you know, and he's down in the bunk room and then he'd run out and throw up. And we're just freaking putting the wood to the reds. And we're pushing up to around 1,000 pounds of fish. We want to get 2,000 at least yeah. before we go home. And he yells at me and he says, please, come here. So I go down and I go, what? And he goes, I'm having a heart attack. And oh, go, my yeah, God. Right, right. And he goes, I'm having a heart attack. I'm telling you the truth. And I go, yeah, bullshit. You're not having a heart attack. And so I go out and I go, hey, he says he's having a heart attack. What, what are we going to do here? You know, if he's having a heart attack, you know, and he, we got to do something. And so he calls me down again and he goes, I had a heart attack three weeks ago. And I go, you have a history of heart attacks. And you're telling me you're having a heart attack, right? And he goes, yeah, please help me. And so I look at Paul and I go, I have no choice. So grab the Marine Radio, Channel 16, Coast Guard Radio Long Beach. This is the Thunderfish. Do you read me? You know, put a mayday out pretty much. And so a guy comes back to me and he goes, okay, where, where are you? know, what's going on? Where are you? And we only had Lawrence C's in those days. So yeah. it's kind of hard to figure that out. But we were near an oil rig. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he goes, are you declaring captain, right? I'm 18. Like, yeah. Captain. I'm not even a captain. I'm my captain. But he says, captain, are you declaring an air to sea rescue? And I said, I look down at the bunker and I go, am I? <laughs> and he goes, yes. And I go, yes, sir. I'm declaring. Well, it was about 15 minutes and we had an F-16 go, or whatever it was. Yeah. It was buzz right over our asses and then bank out and i go oh they know where we are now damn that's cool how cool is that to my brother you know we're like yeah that's pretty bitching and so the coast guard goes we got a helicopter in route we need you to go to that rig they've got a landing platform and offload your guy and so i'm like okay so so it was like blowing 20 yeah 20 at least maybe a little worse than that and six to eight foot seas and i gotta back up to this rig and I'm like, talking to the guys on the rig now, they they were in on it. And I'm like, I can't, hey, this freaking swell is going to push me into that rig. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, you can do it, Cap. Come on, you can just back it up here. We're going to drop a net to you, and, you know. Like, <laughs> All right, so I back up, and then I'm like, my brother's like, punch it! Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like going in. So they drop this net down, and... They drop a guy or two in the net to get Gordon to help yeah. get him out. So he's in the bunker room. And meanwhile, my brother's jacket gets tangled in the net and oh, it's dragging shit. him off the boat. I think he like took a knife and cut his sleeve off. 
And so that that we were good there. So they finally get Gordon out. Put they him, put him in a net. Yeah, like, like a, a cargo a hoop net. or what do you call it? Cargo like, net, right? Yeah, kind of like that. That's they, what I'm imagining. They drop this net there, like uh, when the Coast Guard rescues somebody, like a basket. Or like when you climb over those walls, those kind of things. That's like what I'm the thinking. net. Kind of like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, like the military kind of deal. Something like that, yeah. Because I'm trying to run this freaking boat. Anyway, <laughs> this freaking swell pushes our tuna tower with our radar, and we just go boom into part of the rig and puts this huge dent in our tower, but it didn't. Mess it up, damage to the boat, yeah. mess the tower up. Damn. And so I punched it, and then, you know, like, there he goes. He goes up, and the guys are gone and everything. And my, we go, and we're out there, like, rock caught in, you know, again, <laughs> and we're catching fish. And then I go, hey, look, there he goes. <laughs> and so you see, like, the helicopter take out. I go, well, you know, hopefully he's okay, you know. Yeah. I saw him two weeks later. I go, hey, you okay, dude? You know, I don't even think I talk. I, I should have called him or that. I, I can't remember. You okay? And he goes, yeah, hey, I faked that because I was seasick. Oh my you god! A hole. Doesn't he have to pay for all that crap? He would have had, dude. He's dead now, so I, he's not going to get in any trouble. <laughs> That's like uh, a thirty. I think it's like thirty grand or something like yeah, that. Yeah, in those days. So he just said he had one, and then when he got to the thing, he, he was fine. No, he faked it with all those guys too. And then, yeah, but, but he tells me, them I had it or yeah, whatever. Right. Oh, I had chest pains. But doesn't is, is there medical expenses that he has to? No, not with? in those days. In oh, fact, you wow. didn't have to pay for the towing. I broke. I ran out of fuel on the dumping grounds. Ran from Redondo to the dumping grounds, 120 miles. Yeah. To catch albacore, ran out of fuel. Called the Coast Guard. Guy shows up on a cutter, and he says, hey, "You boys are having a little trouble." He was a real cool guy. The yeah. Guy that was running it, and he goes, "All right, hey, I need somebody on the wheel. Even though we're towing you guys, I need somebody on the wheel." So it was, yes, sir. You know, no problem. You know, turn the radio up full volume and then go down to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, are you guys on the wheel? Yes, sir. We're on the wheel. You know, you run out as quick as you can, you know. And um, but the funny thing was, when we got up, we looked at the cutter. He's towing us, right? You know what he's doing off to the side of his rig? What, the trolling. Trolling. <laughs> yeah. Were you guys trolling or no? Uh, no, we weren't. But the guy, he, he goes, "Man, I sure love Albacore." And I go, "Hey, man, we got how many you want? You know, yeah. here you go." When he first pulled in there, but cost zero. That's crazy. Yeah, he towed us into San Diego and left us there. So, uh, there was a couple of crazy. There was more crazy commercial stuff. Believe me, it, you know we had no idea what the hell we were doing. Yeah, no idea. Damn. So we're learning on the fly. That's yeah. for sure. That's super crazy. Yeah. So you got your credits for doing your after school program. Yeah, right. You're going now. The only classes I got A's in. Yeah. Yeah. So now <laughs> you graduate from Bishop. What do you do? Oh, uh, he broke the rule. No, yeah, I right. have this His is an emergency. So, Jessica, even if my phone's on silent, it rings through. Oh, so we'll pick, it pick it up. See what the emergency is. No, no, no. The, no, what I have it from? set like that because you know the job she has. It's very. Well, is she calling with an emergency? Yeah, no. pick it up. Oh, no, that's just what I have it set to. Oh, okay. So oh, it rings every time. I know no she's. To me. Yeah. yeah, but I know she's calling with some BS. Oh, okay. Right now. All right. What was the question? <laughs> what did you do after you graduated? So wait, no, that was after you graduated, right? The commercial fishing or uh, no? Yeah, I was at Loyola. Okay. Church, yeah. So now Would... we're at Loyola. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then in between all that, I went to Costa Rica for a year, spent a year there. That's where you learned most of your Spanish, or did you learn it in Mexico beforehand? No, I learned. I could, I didn't speak any Spanish. Oh, so when you got it from Costa Rica, you came back and were like, "Well, I could use this in Mexico." Yeah. That's totally. cool. That's really cool to yeah, keep. Totally. Oh, nice. Yeah, and all through Spanish class at Bishop Montgomery, I couldn't say hola. Yeah, I that's crazy. Know. Yeah, because it made no sense. I mean, that's funny because in my Spanish classes, I had Mexican guys cheating off my test. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one thing that a teacher, I think, needs to do is to show the student why it is important to learn and do it on the student's level. With any subject. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, for some student, it might be, hey, you'll be able to do business in Mexico and the for some other schmuck, it might be, hey, there's lots of pretty girls in Mexico. You yeah. want to look, whatever it takes to motivate that person. What it took for me was I went to Costa Rica, started meeting all these little kids that I was teaching, and they're all the coolest kids and the funniest kids, and they're saying stuff to me, and I'm like, I want to know what they're saying. Yeah. And I want to be able to say something. I remember the first time I said something to a kid in Costa Rica, maybe like, como estas? How are you? And they go, oh, bien, y tú? 
I, it was like, oh my God, he understood me. Yeah. You know, it was so cool. I, I want more sentences and more vocabulary. And I want to learn more. And yeah. so that really induced me to want to learn more and more of the language. So I spent a year there, a couple of years in Costa Rica also, or what? in Mexico. Well, we're skipping over some things here. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a uh, time check while you okay. ask well, this question. Why are you there? Uh, Why'd you stay there? Yeah. So Costa Rica, I, uh, there was a priest named Father Ignatius. Great guy. Mm-hmm. Toe rings. We used to go out and spray people with a fire extinguisher after a class at Bishop Montgomery. Um, <laughs> great guy. Uh, super good guy. Um, and we used to, um, he, he was going to Costa Rica to teach in the missions, and he said, you should go. And it was at a time when I had knee surgery. I was in the hospital. So I was like, I didn't. Tobogganing, right? Tobogganing. That's the thing you told us you were attacked by a white shark for Yeah, years. exactly. <laughs> with a scar on my knee. I He's just, got like 40 sc- stitches up his knee and I like get bit by a white shark. 15 years we believed it was a white shark yeah. attack. Yeah. We got 25 minutes left. That's it? Just giving you a heads up. Yeah. yeah. We might have to do a part two. Yeah, we might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I went there and then I would teach kids. And uh, part of the funny story about Costa Rica was when we got there, there was a German priest who was really super strict. So like someone would come to the front of the parish and they said, we had this baby, and we want to have a baptism. And this priest was like, are you married? And no. Oh, you're, no, you're going to hell. I'm not baptizing your baby. And <laughs> So they'd be going, you know, with their heads down. And Father Ignatius would run out the back and say, hey, where do you live? I'll be there tomorrow. We'll baptize your baby. Oh, that's Take cool. Care. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, uh, so he's a super good guy, super cool guy. And so I would teach. One of the things I did was there was a house of prostitution not too far down the street from the parish. Yeah. And this priest tried to convert those girls from prostitution into doing a sewing Mm co-op. Sewing clothing, selling the clothing, making money that way. And he pulled it off. He got all those girls out of that business. But I taught their kids English. So their kids would come and we'd goof around and, you know... I taught the kids English, and yeah. I would walk. I had long, long hair in those days, looked like Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. And I'd walk by the cat house, the pro- prostitution place, and the girls would all come out, Felipe! And so people driving by are like, man, that guy must be spending some serious money at that place, <laughs> you know? It's pretty ironic. The father taught the girls to make clothes. Instead of taking clothes off, yeah. they made clothes right. to put on. That's really cool. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So there's definitely a little tagline in there for a great nonprofit. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. I'm yeah. telling you. One of the funniest things, man, I'll tell you, and I had no idea how dangerous it was. So like, one of the first times I met those kids, they were in a freaking closet. Do it. I, they kept like screaming, like they're in this. And I go, what is going on? You know, I didn't speak Spanish. I was just there. And there was 5,000 rats oh, and they were God. in these bricks and they were killing, they were trying to kill these rats. And there were literally kids coming out with like, by the tails with five rats in each hand. Jeez. So I was in there like throwing stuff and you know, you could easily have gotten bitten by one of them. The way, it was, <laughs> we were so, I, I hate this. So, thing, they were throwing them in the water. It was bizarre stuff, man, but it was so funny. I was all over that. So, yeah, some crazy stuff definitely. When I was when I was living in Latin America, it was still Costa Rica was not like it is now. It was a little bit more wild, let's put it that way. Yeah. Hey, and moving <clears throat> forward with this podcast, I don't want you to rush anything. Yeah. We'll just do another part two. Okay. We got about twenty minutes left. Yeah, we can we can stop at any point and pick it up whenever. Well we're gonna stop in twenty minutes. But um when we get to about five, I want to go over a little bit of what you're doing now, and I'll, I'll let you know when a good time is yeah. for that, so people can follow you now. Yeah. So, what are we talking about? <laughs> no, where are we? You're in Loyola now. All right. So, at Loyola, Loyola, what, what are you? What are you going to Loyola for? Uh, because I had no idea what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. I was a history major. Totally enjoyed my time there. Pretty useless degree in many ways, you know. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, at least I got a better idea of the world and made some dear friends, Father Sweeney, Father uh, uh, Tom Maloney, who graduated from Notre Dame, was a big domer, and loved to fish. I really want to talk about that USC story. Oh, my God. 
So uh, Tom was great because he used to go, go fishing with John Dipley with me. Yeah. And Dipley was always really courteous, you know, father, blah, blah, blah. And Why? Is that funny or something? Is he not a courteous guy? Yeah, you know, he's a, he's a guy. You know, sport fishing guys are, I don't want to say they're not courteous. Many of them are, but they're. Right. They're, they're, they're kind of okay. salty guys. Blue collar, salty. Yes. Kind of macho, you know. One, like, one of my favorite stories you tell about Dibley is yeah. when he's saying they're coming right under the boat and he's laying on his back in the wheel. Oh my god, that was yeah. I mean, set that up. That's freaking hilarious. Yeah, John Dibley is like, um, I walk up in the wheelhouse. I believe it was the Grande, and he says to me, "What's going on out there?" He's like asleep, and people out. And I go, oh, "It's kind of crappy, you know. There's not much going on. Caught a couple bass, and you know, not much." And he goes. Hand me the bike. And he's on his back, <laughs> laying there. On the floor? Or on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> on the floor. And he's like, hey, everybody, uh, see some yellows boiling up here in the bow, so <laughs> change your baits and uh, work hard at it. You might want to drop down to some lighter death. And he hands me the bike. <laughs> He's just laying there, you know. It's so funny. He was a funny guy. See, that's why I think it's funny that you, like when you brought the Sweeney down there, he's really like, oh, yeah, sir. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. I remember... There was a, uh, I was working for Dipley on the Redondo Special, and the first deck on the boat told me, what did he tell me? He was just being a complete a-hole. Yeah. So I go, guess what, I quit. I'm done with this. And I had one of those big wooden tackle boxes, and he takes it and he just shatters it, throws it down on the ground, and busts it into a million pieces. And then he comes at me, and we are on, in a full-on fist fight in Basin 3 in Redondo with Rick Effinger and all the guys on the city of Redondo yelling, kick his ass, Phil! <laughs> and so we're just going at it. And finally, get him in a headlock. And next thing I know, man, I got a big chunk out of my arm. He bites the hell out of me. Jesus. My shoulder. And I'm like, what the hell? So I remember I went to Dipley's. You know, I've got a bloody t-shirt on. And I go, John, look, look what happened. He goes, Hey, you better go get a rabies shot. <laughs> that was about. I forget what happened at that. I think I still quit, and you know, no big, you know, whatever. Yeah, and stuff like that happens in the sport fishing business. But uh, yeah, he's a character, definitely. So I was at Loyola, and um, I also spent some time working in the ticket office at Redondo Sport Fishing. So I got to understand the business from that level. Also, how crazy it is. The phones are ringing constantly. Yeah. You got 300 people going out on the night barge, and the half day boats are coming in, and the overnight boats. This is when Redondo was one of the hubs of sport fishing. Mm -hmm. It's not anymore, but at that time, it was like Ooh. one of the Why? big places. Why? What happened? How come it's. I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I still think it could get that way. And many people will say the guys that are over there right now uh, are doing a fantastic job of bringing it back. Uh, I don't mean to disparage them by saying it's not now, it's just that at that time, there were two island boats going every night. There were two half-day boats. There was a three-quarter day boat. There was a whale watching operation. There was some charter boats. Uh, that's all I mean to say about yeah. that. You know, it was really yeah. rocking in those days. Yeah. And there was a lot of good Redondo guys. Uh, Eddie Leland came out of there. Um, Pat Torres. Conklin. Yeah. Ton Torres. Yeah. Who's dead? He died, right? Jason, the uh, monster sea bass. Yeah. Shallow water blackout. Do you remember Deborah Gonzalez? Deborah Gonzalez, uh, yes. Yeah, it was a real cute girl. Yes. She was on our show from time to time. Mm -hmm. and I, uh, he, uh, I went with her, and Taurus trained her to uh, certify. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, you want to hear a fun? When I was working mall security, we get a call that there is a lunatic in the parking lot. And uh, I go, all right, give me a description. We'll head over there. And they're like, it's a big shaved head guy. The most recognizable thing is a smiley face tattoo on his back. And I go, smiley face tattoo. And I roll up and it's Taurus. And everyone's petrified. Because Taurus was a big dude. He had this smiley face tattoo on his back with the eyes X'd out. He looked nutty. He had face tattoos? Face tattoos, yeah, right? neck tattoos. He looked like yeah, he right. Those guys got kind of intimidated. None right? of my guys. Those are guys that have checked out of ever being a corporate bank. Yes. Or whatever. None of my <laughs> security guys know that I know this guy. I kept it to myself. And I walked up and I go, Hey, Taurus, he turns around, he goes, Phil, and I give him a big hug and a handshake. What are you doing out here? You're scaring everybody. He goes, I'm waiting for the bus. <laughs> I go, well, we got phone calls. I go, just chill, I guess. He goes, all right, see ya. But all the guys looked at me like, how the fuck do you know that guy? And I go, oh, he's a cat. I used to work for him on the special. Um, I have another question. It might be too early to ask, but it's kind of the question I want to end on. 
with where did you get your public speaking? Did that come naturally? Was it your parents? Was it law school? Was it always just talking to different people? Because you have a gift for connecting with people anywhere you go, whether it was in China, whether it was in Mexico, here, you can like really make friends very quickly. And then obviously on podcasts and radio, you've been, it seemed growing up, seemed like you've been natural at it the whole time. Yeah, I, I think it's God given. And to be honest with you, I feel like my oratory skills are better now than they've ever been. And I mm. feel like they are because of the morning briefing. Yeah, just because every single morning practice. I have to, yeah, reps, right? Yeah. Right? And um, I just feel like I've given a couple recent lectures at fishing clubs. Yeah. I feel like I'm way more on my game than I feel like. 976 to today's and stuff was over the top and maybe a little yeah. too enthusiastic. But it was and, perfect for that time. It was. Yeah, that's it worked what that out. time was. Yeah. yeah, it worked out good. But I feel like now doing the reps. Right? Yeah. There's no day that I'm not doing something in front of the camera. Um, and it's God given. And also, my mom was a really good example. She, same thing. She could make friends with anybody. I watched her make friends with, it didn't matter what color you were, what race any of that stuff she she can make friends with you in about 30 seconds so yeah. um yeah i just i really 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 like people yeah which is why i you know while i'm waiting to make millions of dollars on my podcast which is never gonna happen but that's why i bartend yeah and that's why i don't mind bartending i don't like um you know the idea of being like in a cubicle in a corporate kind of situation yeah like selling insurance i did that for a while I'd almost rather be in prison yeah. than do that. And I know there are people out there that do that mm -hmm. and they feed their families and my, I, they have my deep respect. But for me, and there's been some really tough times in my life, like, where am I going to get the money to do this? How am I going to pay this? I have nowhere to live right now. That kind of, I wouldn't trade that for the life that I've had, which has been such an adventuresome life. Yeah, uh, It's been crazy in that way. But uh, where, was I, where were we going with this? <laughs> Just talking about your public speaking, like yeah, so it um, mostly came naturally. It came but natural. With the reps, it seems like the reps are what do it. Yeah, and and the reps were on nine seven six too, know, also, mm -hmm. but that was kind of, um, it was that was pretty much all fishing because I had three minutes to get it out there. Yeah. Now what I'm doing is more trying genuine. to mix in some humor. You, I, I try to stay away from politics. Try to stay away from that. Sometimes I get tempted with stuff that seems so vital. Yeah. And so horrific or something to make a comment. And I'll get somebody who puts a comment like, stick to fishing. So, yeah. And they're right, in a way. They're, they're coming for the fishing. Yeah, they don't want to hear that. They're yeah, hearing they've it. They've enough of it. Yeah, they're yeah. hearing it from every other angle. The, and, I, and so I, I, I think I've learned that if I want to do that, I'll open another channel. Yeah. That caters to people who want to hear that. But I, I've listened to the people who put those comments. Yeah, I think they're right. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you want to if you go to a comedy routine, you don't want to hear about horrific war situation. You want to escape. Yeah, and I go to the movies. Exactly. That is the way I escape reality. I go to a three-hour movie and I sit there and I want to see something that entertains me and takes me away from my work or my the reality of what's going on. So yeah, and then I think you two are much more bubbly than I am. Probably so the no, worst way thing? to say it. No, no, no. But you guys are very extroverted, I would say, and kind of good speakers and exciting speakers. Where I'm more like kind of laid back. But I think it's important for me to not try to match that and just do what I feel. Do me. I'm just going to be me. Well, I mean, you're anchoring this show and doing a fantastic job, if you ask me. So, um, well, both of you guys. But, yeah, you have to be who you are. Once yeah. you start trying to be somebody else. People can sniff that out. Yeah. Yeah. You're not genuine then. Exactly. And they can tell. Exactly. I've had some guys meet me and say, oh, I was curious when I finally met you whether you'd be a big a-hole or you'd be a cool guy. And most of them say, yeah, you are an a-hole. No. <laughs> most guys, you know, I, I try to treat everybody really decently. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't think that I'm anything special. You know, I'm just like anybody else. You know? Yeah. I have a few gifts from the Lord and that's it. Yeah, you figure them out. And figure them. Um, so, if people want to hear more stuff like this, how do they find you? Do you tell stories like this on your Freedman Adventures? Or yeah, oh yeah. Well, we do recap? long form podcasts. Well, yeah. this has been pretty good. 
in terms of my history, because as you guys said, I, I don't think we've ever sat down and done that. Yeah, we still, I think, have to, a lot more to cover. Steve, Steve from Promar uh, wanted to do this, you know, from the very beginning. Yeah. And, uh, so, Steve Oropesa. So, uh, if they want to find me, uh, Friedman Adventures on YouTube uh, is a great way to do it. Uh, yeah. You can also find me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and uh, anybody that uh, wants to get in touch with me personally, 657-227-6459. They can welcome beautiful, to do that. Beautiful. And if this podcast is being recorded, it will be on your platform as well. Uh, 100%. Is, yeah, uh, 100%. You can watch it here or there. We don't care. Well, so <laughs> how do people find you guys if they're on my platform? So we're Bass Bros Fishing. I think it's Bass underscore Bros Fishing on Instagram. Instagram I'm most active on. That if you want to reach me, you have a question. We love answering fishing questions. If you want to see what we've been up to, follow our Bass Bros Instagram. YouTube's where you're going to find our podcasts. This podcast that you're watching right now. Subscribe, please. That helps us, you know, continue to work and put these out. And, um... Yeah, YouTube and Instagram is our big thing. Do I miss anything? I feel like I'm missing TikTok. Something. TikTok, we're on TikTok. We post some funny stuff here and there. We we try to do our theme is informational comedy. Like we try to put out information that's gonna help you. With we like screwing around. You love screwing around. It's just because of you, we now screw around fishing. And anybody who's ever been on our boat knows exactly what that looks yeah. like. 500 <laughs> fart noises. <laughs> yeah, so I would say we're more informational with like a lighthearted comedy sense. And if you enjoy that, then we're for you. If you don't enjoy it and you absolutely hate it, just comment and like... Let us know. Yeah, we love that. We've been getting a lot of bad comments. It's so funny. But either way, I like every comment that we get because we really do appreciate them, even if you're being a dick. <laughs> yeah, it's entertaining. It's inter some, some guys are cracking me up on it. Uh, but yeah, informational comedy. My dream is to shoot comedy sketches. I enjoy the entire process of writing something out. Yeah, me too. To film. Yeah. And making people laugh. Right. That's what I really enjoy. But you guys should jump on our Christmas party if you're not doing anything December 2nd and invite all your Bass Bros fans to come to that. It's at the Redondo Beach Rod and Gun Club. Oh, cool. And I don't know, you're going to have to check your schedule and that dates this podcast a little bit. This would have been December 2nd, 2023. But we're going to have food and all kinds of great stuff. It'll be a fun time. You can invite all your guys too. What's going to happen? Uh, I think we're going to have Santa Claus. So if you want to bring the kids for Santa Claus... A great meal, chicken tacos, rice, beans, all kinds of raffles, you know, cornhole, all kinds of casting fun. It's yeah. going to be great. And there's going to be, uh, I think Bill Wilkerson is coming from the Malahini and a bunch of other guys. Mike Morrison is going to come from 22nd Street Landing. So it should be a really fun afternoon. That's awesome. We've got one time for one more thing. I wanted to bring that up really quickly. I know you got to go to a chili cook-off. Um... Tell us what's been going on with Notre Dame and that whole USC. You had um, some USC fans kind of chirping at you before the game. What was that? Oh, God. Well, that has to be one of the most rewarding games <laughs> I have watched in a long time. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Caleb Williams, he painted F-U-C-K Notre Dame on his fingernails. And, you know, he's a kid. And... And I listen to one of my Notre Dame guys that I really like. So I listen to a podcast. Yeah. And he's all Notre Dame. And he, I think he's right. He goes, everything I've heard about that kid, Caleb, he's a really good kid. He studies hard. He works hard. He's a good kid. You know who I blame that on? The guy was saying. And I, I thought this at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. His coach. Yep. Yeah. And because he should know better. Lou Holtz, if you had that on your fingernails, you wouldn't be playing in the game. Yeah. And I hope the same thing goes with the Notre Dame coach right now. To to make that point, I put a significant amount of money on Notre Dame one year, and the teams were like one and two. It was yeah. a huge game. It was at the Coliseum. And before the game starts, there's this buzz through the whole place. And I'm going, is this what? That... The two best Notre Dame players were in South Bend. Holtz oh, left them no. there. Why? 
They showed up five minutes late for mass. Jesus. The two best players. And I go, great, thanks, Lou. Really appreciate it, man. <laughs> Notre Dame blew him out. That's crazy. And he, he said, the te- no individual is more important than the team. And I'm sure he went into that locker room and says, we got our two best guys at home. You guys are going to have to step it up. Yeah. And so uh, this this whole Caleb Williams thing, the F Notre Dame and everything, was kind of, I still enjoyed that they beat them so significantly. You know, Bob Osborne has been talking. Uh, yeah, they played a prank on you before that. Yeah. They, which we didn't know about until the day of the game. Dad. Right. What was, what did, did they write on there? Go USC. Go on USC. Oh, he wrote fight on. Oh, fight on. On the, on the bottom of your coffee cup. Yes. And he would drink it on morning briefing. Right, and it would and show would say, up. Fight on. Which is pretty funny. It's, it's really good. good. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, that was great. And I never noticed it because, you know, I only listen to the audio pretty much when yeah. I, you know, make sure that's all good. And so, yeah, that was, that was a funny one. And the good Lord above, man, that coffee cup was sitting there, and I bumped into it, and it fell on the ground and broke. <laughs> and I had no idea... That was on there. So my higher power man just shot a lightning bolt down yeah. and blew it up. And you had your your Bob Osborne was he was saying something about Notre Dame not being undefeated or something. What yeah, was he was saying, man, it's such a bummer. This is before the game that Notre Dame is not undefeated. We sure like to kick the crap out of an undefeated Notre Dame before we go on to the national championship. Yeah. So uh, I haven't seen Bob. He's in Florida right now. So I'm definitely. Excited yeah. about Seattle. Now they lost to, what was it Utah last week? They got yeah. blown out by Notre Dame. They got blown out. How was that game? What did you guys think? Right. It was the most relaxing. Even at halftime, we're up. We're like, let's keep scoring. Yeah, what right. do you mean relaxing? We lost our under. I know, yeah. In the last sucks. two minutes. Dude, that, I'll lose that then every Yeah, day. exactly. Yeah. After we lost the under, I'm like, it just ram it down their throats team. now. So then they lost to Utah, and I think they're currently losing to Cal. When we yeah, today they were. Yeah, they were behind the Cal. They got all kinds of problems there. They really do. Yeah, well, start calling your <laughs> start calling your fingernails. Again. I remember during the game we were blowing out USC, and we had another USC fan over. And Dad just goes, "Wow, they're going to be lucky to play Fresno in a bowl game." <laughs> I'm not going to do any cheap jokes like you know, you can't spell suck without USC. I'm not doing any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, so that was an amazing day, and we just wanted to chirp back at our little USC haters out there. So, um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Freeman Adventures, Bass Bros Fishing, if you guys want to continue to follow along the journey. Dad's got plenty more adventures in him, and so do we. But we'll catch you on the next episode. It sounds like we got a part two coming up. We're going to pick, pick up after Loyola, and we're going to start getting into the good stuff. Are you going to do crappy again next week? Of course, I gotta catch a new record. <laughs> I, want, I'm, I might go out all week. <laughs> I'm coming back next week. Yeah, we'll see what your schedule lines up. Oh, that sounds good. All right, guys. Oh shoot, next week I'm you on the uh, horizon. Yeah, no, we'll, no, no, we'll, figure, we'll it figure it out. out. Yeah, we'll, we'll, there'll be a part two. Play the end of the podcast and pick up where we left off. Perfect. All right, everybody, thank you All so boys, much. Hey, that's fun. Good times. Go Irish. <laughs>